and there are giants of negativism, 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 looming on the horizon, giants of greed, envy, and lust lurking in dark places of our existence. Shame prevents us from exposing these giants to anyone around us. But have you ever asked yourself this question? Why is there still a giant in my life? Why, since I have given my life, my heart, and my mind to the guidance of the Spirit, do I still have giants to battle? These giants have poured out their putrid accusations against me, and I have no idea how to conquer them. The Word of God does not leave us without an answer to this predicament. We can understand why giants still loom in our lives, brothers and sisters. On with this understanding, we can enter the battlefield and finally bring these gargantuans monsters of the mind into submission. Yes, these giants are in our minds because since Jesus died on the cross and every time we do a sermon, it all circles back to Jesus Christ. We have the victory. I will be preaching from you this morning from the message why you still have that giant. 1 Samuel 4 1 says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined in the battle, Israel was spitting before the Philistines, and they slew of the army over 4,000 men. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore have the Lord spitting us today before the Philistines? They were simply smitten because they did not consult God before they went into battle. There is no way we can go into battle with an enemy, an invisible enemy that has us outnumbered, that has us outweaponized, and we can win in a battle. So someone finally came to their senses and they said, we must take the Ark of the Covenant and we must put get God involved and we must get God involved in the battle. So they took the Ark, brothers and sisters, from Shiloh and they brought it on the battlefield. And as they brought the Ark on the battlefield, all of a sudden they came together in unison. They came together in harmony. And then the Spirit of God came upon them and the enemy started to get afraid and they said to themselves, how in the world can we defeat the children of Israel? How can we defeat the children Children of God, whenever God is in the midst. So now they're upset, discombobulated, and confused and afraid, but nothing happened. Not only did nothing happen, but they had the presence of God. I'm talking about the children of Israel. They had the presence of God in their lives, but God did not do the work. God did not fight the enemy. Why? Because they did not consult God before they went into the battle in the first place. We have to understand what the scriptures say. We can't do things the way we want to do them. It is God's will, not our will. Amen. So someone finally came to their senses and they said, how in the world can we defeat the Philistines, because the Philistines, they were a giant to the people of Israel. You know, you have giants in your lives on this morning. You know the giant that's in your mind, the giant that makes you struggle with that thing that no one knows about, the giant that keeps you awake at night because you don't know how you're going to make it, the giant that keeps on telling you that you're not good enough. But I got news for you. Nothing is too hard for God on this morning. You better get your giant to the Lord because you still have that because you have it, giving it to Jesus. Sometimes later, the Ark of the Covenant arrived and the whole of Israel began to shout with praise. As I said before, whenever you involve God too late, God will not show up. Brothers and sisters, this is a thing that we have to have deep down in our hearts because God searches your mind and God searches your heart. What's on the inside is going to show up on the outside. And when God don't show up for you on the outside to fight your battles, then God must not be in your heart. We got to get God in our heart, brothers and sisters, by reading in the word, by fellowshipping together, by coming to Bible study, by coming to Sunday school, by being obedient to what the word says, by loving one another, by having compassion for one another, and most of all, having the love of God in our heart and being led by the spirit. So now that God has come into the camp and the enemy is afraid, nothing has happened, and now they are in a worse condition than they were before. Because not only did 4,000 die, but now 
30,000 have died. And now they have become shattered because they did not put the word of God into their heart. The word says, God will direct your path. So if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. So whenever you're fighting the giant, you can't fight the giant if God isn't by your side. Because you're not doing the fighting. God is doing the fighting in your stead. There is a tremendous blessing that comes from considering the Lord first. Instead of developing our own plan, then asking the Lord's permission, we should be asking the Lord for his plan, then going on and we should be about our father's business. I want to share a hypothetical story of a young man who was desperate to do the will of God. He took out a piece of paper, wrote down all the things he wanted God to do, and he signed the paper. He signed the contract. Then he took the paper to the church, laid the paper on the altar, and began to explain it to the Lord. After a little while, the Lord interrupted him and said, uh, little boy, son, you have it all backwards. I want you to take out that piece of paper and sign your name to the bottom of it. Then do the things that I write on the paper. Are you doing the things that God is writing on the paper? Or are you taking your supplications to the Lord? The supplications that you want for your selfish self. Are you taking God's will and God's way into your life because God is the author and finisher of your faith. No one knows your story better than an almighty, almighty God. You better get on board with what God has written in your story on this morning. How often are we like this little boy, brothers and sisters? How often are we taking our contracts to God and telling God what we want? Brothers and sisters, never considering what the Lord has in store for our lives. David declared the blessings that come to those who consider the Lord first in all things. David said, I have been young and now I'm old, but yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor have I seen his seed begging bad bread. Are you begging for anything on this morning? Because God will supply all your needs. All you got to do is have faith. Stretch out on your faith. Faith with our brothers and sisters. If you have faith, then whatever you think, whatever you think, God will manifest in your presence. Righteous people are people who seek the Lord first. They put God at the beginning instead of at the end. When we evolve the Lord from the beginning, then if we run into trouble, he is already there. For whosoever called on the name of the Lord, God shall save them. And brothers and sisters, you want to be saved, you better call on the name of Jesus. Because when you call on the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue may and shall confess. Even the demons know by faith who Jesus is, and they bow before the name of Jesus. So whenever you are facing a giant, call on the name of Jesus. Put Jesus first, then brothers and sisters, that giant will go into submission. Righteous people are people who seek the Lord first. They put God at the beginning instead of the end. If you want to defeat the giants in your life, get God involved in the beginning. Involve God before your plans are made. Remember that your weapons are not of this world, but giants are defeated in spiritual craft, which produces spiritual power. This power is necessary in bringing down the giants in your life. You can't do it in your own cognitions. You can't do it with your own personal attributes. You got to do it from a spiritual perspective. You can't fight this battle on your own. God has gave us weapons to fight this battle and you know what those weapons are. Those are the armor of God. You got to put on that Holy Ghost armor because if you don't, you don't have any weapons. How are you going to fight a battle without any weapons? Another reason we still have giants in our life is because we have gone into battle without any weapons. Look, at 1 Samuel 13 and 22. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there were neither sword nor spear found in the hands of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan, his son was there found. How are you going to have an army of 30,000 men and nobody have nothing but sticks and stones? Look, sticks and stones may break my bones, but a sword and a spear would do far more impact and it will injure me far more than sticks and stones. Israel had decided they needed a king instead of a god and the Lord gave them what they wanted. He gave them Saul as their leader and Saul had become infatuated with himself. Who wants a leader who cares nothing about 
Nobody except themselves. You know what a year or so ago, that's what kind of leader we had. And people still wanted him as a leader. He was infatuated by his own counsel, invaded by his neighbors, and deserted by his own soldiers. Why? Because he didn't have the presence of God to fight his giants who were the Philistines. I thank God on this morning that the presence of God rest through the by now and forth and forevermore in my land. And God will fight my battles. The people of Israel were in a low state because Philistia and other countries had defeated them so much. Are you tired of being defeated? Don't you want a victory? Well, brothers and sisters, we got the victory. We got the victory when Jesus died on the cross. When Jesus was resurrected after three days, the grave could not hold him down. And when the grave could not hold him down, the grave could not hold you down because you got the victory on this morning. So it came to pass in the days of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hands of any man. That the people except Saul and Jonathan had the spears. You see what happened is one of the tactics of these giants who had defeated Israel was to carry off all of those who would forge iron, make weapons or farm equipment. So they didn't have weapons. Every time they got in the battle, they would take the people who would make the weapons. They would take the people who would make farm equipment. So now they were starving. They couldn't feed themselves and they couldn't defeat themselves. And that's what the enemy has done to some of us. We are starving because we need the spirit. We need the word. We need excitement, spiritual excitement. We need to go deeper. We need to have deeper depth and higher height. And without the spirit, we have none of those things. Without the spirit, we are cut off from the Lord. And we don't have spiritual food. We can't get the things that we need to help us get a battle plan to fight the enemy. And brothers and sisters without weapons, you are rendered totally helpless because the enemy, they are not taking any prisoners. The enemy, they, they mean business. The enemy are trying to wipe you out. The enemy don't care anything about you or anybody that you care about. The enemy wants you dead. The enemy wants to kill you and send you to the pits of hell. The enemy wants your weapons because the enemy does not want a fair fight. So when the battle came to Israel, there was no way of fighting because the enemy possessed all the weapons. How can you fight an enemy who possessed all the weapons? So, what are you trying to use to defeat your giant on this morning? Are you relying on your personal ability, your intellect, your human strength, or your own wisdom? None of these things are powerful enough or sharp enough to destroy the giant of your life. Why? Well, Paul tells us, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, warfare are, are, are not carnal, but mighty through God. For the pulling down of strongholds, brothers and sisters, you are not fighting a human battle. The battle we are fighting is in the heavenly realm, in the spiritual dimension. Your intellect and your human reasoning cannot complete the job. You must be a person who thinks and reasons, but that alone cannot and will not bring down the giant. Your ideology, your theology will not bring down the menacing enemies that haunt your sleep and force you to fear the day. This battle is going to be fought and won in another territory, and that territory is the spiritual realm. You've got to have contact with the spiritual realm, and with that contact, you got all power. you got unlimited power with your limited self. You ain't got no strength. You ain't got no capabilities. But with God, you got all capabilities, and you got all power. against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, brothers and sisters. Not only are they in high places, but they're in low places. They're beside you. They're in front of you. They're behind you. They're at the back door. They're everywhere. You better get God on your side. If you got a giant in your life and you need that giant, take it out. The only person who's going to take that giant out of your existence is Christ. What weapons have you allowed the enemy to capture? Have you allowed the roving raiders of the devil to steal your joy, to steal your prayer, to steal your song, and to steal your testimony? Are you no longer able to fight this battle because there is no iron smith, the Holy Ghost, to create the weapons needed to battle against your enemy, your giant? 
Oh, God, help us. You cannot lay down our weapons. We can't lay down our weapons. You cannot lay down and give up. It's time to do whatever it takes to get your weapons back, get back on the battlefield, and wage war against your giant. How do you do this, you may ask? I'm glad you did. Look at how Paul finished 2 Corinthians 10, 3-4. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity the thoughts to the obedience of Christ. See, the enemy wants to attack your mind. The enemy wants to fill your mind with, with lies because before you ever get on the battlefield, the enemy wants you to think that you're defeated. But see, God cast down all those imaginations. That's why you gotta have God to fight your giants. Without God, it is impossible to defeat a principality, a principality who existed before you ever thought about existing, a principality who was on the right hand of the Father, brothers and sisters, who worked and, 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 and had a job to do in heaven. How in the world can you defeat one third of heaven? It is totally, utterly impossible. These these, these enemies are truculent, they're belligerent. They don't want to do anything but to take you out. So you need the power of God. What does it mean to cast down imaginations? Well, the word imagination simply means lies. The enemy is a liar, and he was a liar from the beginning. He's the author of lies, and whenever you believe his lies, then you are incapable when it comes to fighting the enemy. You see, the greatest battle known to mankind is our thought life. The scriptures declare, as a man thinks, so is he. When we determine to buy only the truth, we step into a dominion that, does, that necessitates submitting our thoughts to Jesus Christ. You see, whenever you submit your thoughts to Jesus Christ, then you cannot submit your thoughts to the enemy. And once you submit your thoughts to Jesus Christ, the thoughts of failure are no longer bound in your life. The thoughts of weakness will no longer abound in your life. The thoughts of defeat will no longer abound in your life. The thoughts of just not being good enough will no longer abound in your life. The thoughts of just not measuring up does not exist in your life. All of our thoughts must be filtered through God because when we filter our thoughts through God, you say it is impossible. But God says, all things are possible. You say, I'm not, I'm too tired. God says, I will give you rest. I will give you strength. You say, nobody loves me. God says, I love you. You say, I can't go on. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. You say, I can't figure it out. God says, thou will direct your step out. You say, I can't do it, baby. But God says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Through Christ who strengthens you. You say, I'm not able. God says with Christ, all things are possible. You are able. You say it's not worth it. God has given us heaven. Brothers and sisters, God has given us his glory. God says it's all with it. You'll be with me for all eternity. You say, I can't forgive myself. God says, I forgive all your sin. You say, I can't. Let it. God says, I'll supply all your needs. You say, I'm afraid. God says, I'm not giving you a spirit of fear, but of love, love, power, and a sound mind. You say, I'm always worried. God says, Word of 
of God. Brothers and sisters, so where the word of a king is, there is power. And what the king say unto them, brothers and sisters, it will come to pass. And if the king said it, you best better believe that it will come to pass. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the blessed only king of the world. So whether his word is spoken, so wherever God's word is spoken, there is power. Speak power against your giant in here on this morning. Wherever his word is, there is liberty. You are free from your giant in here on this morning. Because in the words of a king, there is power. Hide his word in your heart will bring power to your life like never before, like you never like, like you never imagined. Get your sword in your hand, hold on to it, and use it to bring power and promise into your life. Like David, you too will slay your giant. Why do you still have that giant? Because you have not given that giant to the Lord. God will fight your battle. You can't fight your battles on your own. You got your giant because you haven't given your giant to the Lord. And for heaven's sake, Keep praise in your heart and on your lips. Don't give up any territory of praise. The reason why some of us can't beat our giant is because we've given up our territory. And that territory is praise. How are you going to fight a giant? Look at David. David wasn't afraid when he was on the battlefield. David wasn't afraid of all because David had praise in his heart. The whole army of Israel was afraid of one man. They could have taken the other people out that they were fighting against. But they were afraid of one man. Not to mention they didn't have any weapons. But see, David, even though he was under the authority of the law, David still had faith. And David knew if he could kill a lion and a bear and wrestle a sheep, which is a child of God, out of the devil's mouth, then he could kill a no good, nothing, good for nothing, slew footed giant. And David had the power of praise in his heart. Another reason we still have giants in our lives is that we haven't we've given up too much territory. Have you noticed that every time when we have read from the book of 1 Samuel, we always mention the Philistines. Who are the Philistines in your life on this morning? The country was a sore in the side of the people of God. They haunted and taunted them day and night. Is the enemy haunting and taunting you day and night? Just like these Philistines. Then, brothers and sisters, in 1 Samuel 17, we find that the Philistines had gathered together at Shoko, which belonged to God, somewhere in the Israel long, long line of defeats by the giants of this world, they had gave up some territory. Are you giving up territory on this morning? The particular territory belongs to the tribe of Judah. What, what does Judah mean? Judah simply means praise. Have you given up your territory of praise? How could the giant Satan inhibit their praise when we are supposed to be magnifying, praising, and lifting up God. Somewhere along the way, Israel gave up his praise. They gave up the very thing that brought them freedom. Yes, brothers and sisters, the substance of their faith was expressed in praise to the mighty Jehovah. What am I saying in this? That they had grown and thankful for the presence of God and the power of God that they believed that they had nothing left to praise God for. God had blessed them beyond measure, beyond compare, to the point to where they had they no thought that they had a reason to praise an almighty God. Hear me, brothers and sisters, now. Hear me, church. You may have woken up this morning with no with, with problems and pains. Heartaches and headaches, tore up from the floor, broke, busted, and disgusted. But I guarantee you, there is something to give God praise for. You better lift up your hands. You better magnify the Lord. You better exalt his holy name and match his name. Because he's king of kings and Lord of lords. Who is the king of glory? The Lord that's strong and mighty. Who is the king of glory? The Lord that's mighty in battle. You better help me praise. But I guarantee you, you woke up this morning. Because you woke up this morning, no matter what giant you're facing, you better praise the Lord. You got a reason to worship. You got a reason to lift your head. You got 
steal, kill, and destroy. And whatever you got on that first plate, that's your righteousness. So he don't want you to have salvation and righteousness. But when you put on that armor, Yeah. 